Hello and welcome back to another episode of Generation Ochi. My name is American Ben and today we are going to break down the Four of Diamonds game from Alice in Borderland. Sorry to those of you who have seen all of our AIB vids and are tired of hearing this same plot summary over and over again, but for those who need a refresher, Alice in Borderland is about the dangers of using public restrooms of which there are many. But in this case, the misfortune brought on by the lavatory is experienced by three friends in Tokyo, led by antisocial gamer Arisu, who after emerging from a restroom stall where they were hiding from the law, find themselves in a parallel realm known as Borderland, within which they are forced to compete in a series of sadistic death games in order to survive. The games are categorized based on the numbers and suits in a deck of playing cards. The higher the number of the card, the harder the game is. As for the suits, diamond games, the type of game we're looking at today, are battles of wits, spade games are games involving physical prowess, club games are team battles, and finally, hearts games are games of betrayal and involve toying with participants' hearts. Okay, so we have a battle of wits on our hands today. Most of the games we've studied so far have had far-reaching implications for human nature and have required us to think about how despair and other emotional issues play into their outcomes. This one carries some of those characteristics, but overall it's most significant for what it teaches us about the beach. You know, that oasis within Borderland where denizens of this horrid parallel realm can find community and camaraderie, and where ere his death and the onset of the Ten of Hearts game had her reigned long or all, maintaining cohesion among beach members and rallying them to collect all of the cards from the death games. The Four of Diamonds game is the first game we see after Arisu and Usagi arrive at the beach. The setup of the game, called Light Bulb, is as follows. Seven participants are in a room that is slowly filling with water. Adjacent to the main room, there is another smaller room which is sealed off from the main room by a door which can be opened and closed by the participants. The goal of the game is to figure out which of the three switches turns on the light bulb. The game also has a set of rules to it. Rule number one, only one switch among A, B, and C will turn on the light bulb. Rule number two, the participants only have one chance to flip a switch while the door is open. If the door is closed, they can flip the switches as many times as they like. And rule number three, if someone is in the room or if a switch has been turned on, the door will be locked in place and cannot move. Thus, if someone enters the room, they will not be able to shut the door and spy on the bulb while another participant flips a switch. Additionally, the participants only have one chance to answer as a group. If they answer correctly as to which switch turns on the bulb, they clear the game. However, if the water level rises and reaches the electrical wires before they figure out the correct switch, they lose. A potential fate which absolutely shocks one of the contestants. So what are the secrets to this game? What does it teach us about Borderland? Well, let's back up for a second. Earlier on in this episode, Hatter explains to the new blood, Usagi and Arisu, how at the beach, everyone has to work together. Now in previous videos, I've lambasted the beach as a pure con. One designed to help Hatter find his way back to the real world at the expense of other beachgoers. Well, I suppose I offered a little bit of a more sophisticated explanation than that. Please do watch the video on Hatter if you want to know what I actually said. But the point is, I haven't given the beach a lot of credit in regards to its functionality as an entity aiding Borderlands denizens in their attempts to overcome the death games. However, it's the light bulb game that forces me to change my mind just a bit. The reason that Hatter urges everyone to work together isn't only because he wants them to labor for him. It's also because he knows that it takes a mix of talent and intelligence to beat the games. At one point, Arisu seems suspicious of Hatter, observing that the beach members are being formed into a personal army that Hatter can use to collect the cards. <laughs> However, what Arisu doesn't recognize is that two things are true at once. One, Hatter is using them, and two, that's not such a bad thing, perhaps. Just before the light bulb game begins, we see the participants head off to different games, and presumably each of the participants has been assigned to a specific game.
If you remember from the first game in the series, Arisu is good at puzzle games, and luckily enough, he ends up being assigned to a puzzle game. That said, it's unclear whether or not the executive members of the beach know what type of game this is before the contestants take part in it. Nonetheless, one way or another, Arisu ends up in a game that he is particularly suited for. Some other contestants in the light bulb game, however, appear to be rather ill-suited for the game. <laughs> Both Tata and Kuina seem pretty confused for the duration of the game, but they've been assigned to a group whose members boast a mix of different skills. Prior to this, we see Usagi end up in what seems to be a puzzle game. As she's more gifted in tests of physical prowess, I imagine she may have struggled in this game and made it out thanks to the talents of others, though I'm speculating. The point is that the executive council at the beach very carefully makes up the groups slated to attend different games, apparently trying to include at least one person who is good at each type of game in every game. So back to the light bulb game. We see Tata suggest an ill-advised strategy for determining the correct switch. <laughs> He thinks they should just use up their one switch flip allowed with the door open, and then just take a shot and guess between the two remaining switches as to which one turns the light on. After all, as he says, they have a 50% chance of success this way. Since he's not good at puzzle games, and perhaps not very good at math either, he suggests a strategy that doesn't represent the group's best strategy for beating the game. Executive member Ann Razuna then interjects to point out that the chances of succeeding using Tata's plan are actually 66%. Which is true, of course, because while yes, there is a 50% chance of correctly guessing the switch that turns the light bulb on after eliminating one of the three choices by using the one flip allowed with the door open, this does not take into account the fact that there is a 33% chance of choosing the correct switch on the flip with the door open. Thus, Tata's strategy offers them a guess at two of the three switches. Anne reveals herself to be an astute puzzle solver here, something we come to reaffirm later during the Ten of Hearts game. And because she's a talented puzzle solver, she is especially suited to scout Arisu and judge his puzzle solving skills, and as she tells Arisu going into the game, this is a test for him. <laughs> This is what makes me think that somehow the executive members of the beach know what this game is going to be going into it. It's still possible they don't, but it seems rather fortunate that Anne and Arisu end up in a diamonds game as opposed to, say, a spades game, which would not allow them to experience Arisu at his best. Eventually, Arisu does figure out the puzzle. The solution is as follows. Close the door, then flip one of the switches, say A, and then wait for a bit so that if the light bulb is on, it has time to get hot. Then turn the switch off, open the door, and flip another switch, say B. If it lights up, then you know the correct switch is B. If it doesn't, then have someone enter the adjacent room and touch the bulb. If it's hot, then that means that switch A is the correct choice. If it's not hot, then by process of elimination, the correct switch must be the only one that remains to be flipped, in this case, C. And this solution allows for a 100% chance of success. So we experience in this game how the executive members planning allows beach members to enter games with a better chance of winning. Thus, being a part of the beach's community actually can increase one's chances of survival. Well, unless the place becomes a game zone. Now, before we close this video out, let's discuss why this game's difficulty level is a four if it's not obvious already. We've discussed this many times before. The difficulty level of the game isn't just dependent on the complexity of its solution, which in this case isn't entirely obvious. Rather, the game's difficulty are based on a variety of factors, none more important perhaps than the nature of the players in the game. I imagine people may say, why have such an easy game this late in the show? Well, this game has two players involved in it who are really good at puzzles, and probably even better at puzzles now that they've done a few puzzle games. I would argue that there's actually very little chance that they wouldn't solve it. As a matter of fact, it's made clear that Anne knows how to solve the game from its start. The fact that this game is even a four is probably because its solution isn't the simplest, relatively speaking. 
There's a bit of a tragic beauty to this game, as Borderland is a dog-eat-dog -dog world in which people often throw others to the fire to save themselves. And yet in the Lightbulb game, we see how much the participants really need to rely on each other in order to survive. Neither Tata or Kawina gets math. And both of them are bad at puzzles and remain confused for the duration of the game. They have to rely on Arisu and Anne in order to survive. Their lives are in the hands of other people, and that's not a very comfortable feeling. However, were this a different type of game, perhaps that power dynamic would shift, and it would be Anne and Arisu waiting on Tata and Kawina to figure everything out. The message to all of this is that in a world full of obstacles, struggle, and despair, the only way to survive is to work together. We mentioned in our video on the Four of Clubs game how having friends with you in Borderlands is a huge advantage. Well, that's not only because they're the people who'd be most willing to sacrifice for you, and nor is it only because they can help you cope with the obstacles ahead. It's also because having a variety of people on your side going into the games means that you have a range of abilities and talents at your disposal in facing off against whatever horrors a game may present. There's a point at the beginning of the episode while journeying across Borderlands natural terrain that Arisu remarks to Usagi that he desires to pick up some of her survival skills. This is a pretty understandable impulse on his part. The more skills he has, the less he has to rely on and trust others. And as someone who is somewhat of a recluse in the real world, well, I'm not sure he's actually so good at the whole trust thing. Borderland actually brings him out of his shell a bit. Once again, the evils of Borderland beget some positive outcomes for the people unlucky enough to find themselves thrust into its grasp. The dangers of the death games force new friendships into existence and teach some people, like Arisu, how to trust others. Anyway, that is the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do give it a big thumbs up. Comment down below. Let me know what you think about the video. Subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell. For now, my name is American Ben, and I'll catch you next time. Generation Ochi, peace.